My name is John Finley. I'm an independent researcher based in Paris, and I would like to present my book, Henri Bertin and the Representation of China in 18th Century France, published in July of this year. The book is a study of the intellectual, technical, and artistic encounters between Europe and China in the late 18th century, focusing on the purposeful acquisition of information and images that characterized a direct engagement with the idea of China. The central figure in this story is Henri Léonard Bertin, who served as a minister of state under Louis XV and briefly Louis XVI. Both his official position and his personal passion for all things Chinese placed him at the center of intersecting networks of like-minded individuals who shared his ideal vision of China as a nation from which France had months to learn. Bertin's direct connections with the French Jesuits in Beijing, the official Mission Française de Pékin, led to an extraordinary correspondence which provided the material for the 15 volumes of articles on the history, sciences, arts, customs, habits, etc. of the Chinese, published between 1776 and 1791. The memoirs concernant les Chinois represent Bertin's most successful effort to disseminate the knowledge that was sent to him from China, including texts that presented translations of key historical Chinese writings and detailed reports or articles, memoirs, on current affairs in mid-Qing China. Engravings in the various volumes depicted many diverse subjects, including two illustrated versions of the life of Confucius. These reflected a contemporary fascination with the evolving and sometimes contradictory depictions of the great Chinese philosopher. The first of a selection of brief portraits or biographies of celebrated Chinese figures throughout history appeared in volume three of the Memoir in 1778, and one of them is a short biography of Confucius. Prepared by Father Joseph-Marie Amiot, who was one of Bertin's most regular correspondents, the biography emphasizes Confucius' efforts to bring virtue and good morals to the various kingdoms of ancient China. It describes what were traditionally believed to be Confucius' com compilations of the Chinese classics, including the Analects. However, the biography itself is very brief, just two pages long, but it is illustrated with an engraving that copies a painting of Confucius from a Chinese album that Amiel also sent to Bertin. The biography here ends with a statement from Amiel that he will provide a biography of this sage in greater detail, and indeed he did. In his Paris residence, Bertin had established a Cabinet de Curiosité Chinoise, his incomparable library and collection of Chinese objects, texts, and paintings. A 1787 guidebook to Paris described Bertin's holdings and noted in part, I quote, but what makes this study all the more interesting is the considerable collection of paintings that Bertin has received from China and which put before our eyes the manners, the customs, the products, and the arts of this great empire which up to now has been so little known to us, end quote. Here, people could examine works such as the unprecedented Essai sur l'architecture chinoise, the Essay on Chinese Architecture, two sumptuously bound albums of paintings, which also included written texts. The paintings illustrate the tools of Chinese craftsmen, the techniques of Chinese construction, and the forms of Chinese architecture, including imperial architecture. The painting here shows a building on a tai, a platform that is part of an imperial palace. Another painting in the Essai sur l'architecture chinoise shows the ceremonial and audience hall in the home of an imperial prince, one of a series of 11 paintings of interiors. All of the paintings follow the same format, a strict single point perspective view and a clear indication of light and shadow. Some of the paintings show views out into other rooms or elaborate gardens and one of them is used on the cover of my book. One detail is worth noting here. On the wall at the right is a landscape painting flanked by a calligraphic couplet, which hang behind a table with a bundle of books, a bronze incense burner, and a red porcelain vase. These are all the accoutrements of a Chinese scholar, and we will see that Bertin received an illustration of just such an arrangement of calligraphy and objects to be recreated for what he planned as an authentic Chinese studio. In 1777, 
Bertin received a set of paintings, which were then bound to it, into an album with the title Chinese Hothouses and the Flowers They Contain. There is no text in the album, but volume three of the memoir concerning the Chinois contains an article entitled Chinese Greenhouses, a text that matches what we see in the paintings. The album painting here shows two views of a building with, on the right, a door that can be covered with a rolled up mat and paper covered lattices. On the left is a cutaway view of the interior. The most important detail of this half is the cross section of the floor, which clearly shows the various channels and vents under the gray brick paving. The article sums up critical elements of the construction of Chinese greenhouses, including the need for a system of furnaces and flues below the floor or under a raised platform. And it notes the French greenhouses would be improved by the incorporation of Chinese technical details. The combination of the published text and the painted illustrations provides an excellent example of the transfer of technical information by words and images. Father Amio had long promised that he would send Bertin a complete life of Confucius. While the figure of Confucius had fascinated Europeans in the 17th and 18th century, Amio wrote that his biography, however, would show Confucius not as Europeans had portrayed him, but as he is seen in China and depicted in his own writings. A portrait of Confucius faces the title page of Amio's Vida Conce, The Life of Confucius, which was finally published in volume 12 of the Memoir in 1786. The portrait is engraved in a thoroughly European style, but the composition and details of the costume and throne carefully reproduce a 16th century woodcut image. A short citation from the writings of Voltaire, included below the portrait, praises the sage's integrity. Voltaire's poem first appeared in the entry De la Chine, on China, in the Question sur l'Encyclopédie in 1770, but this was not the great writer's only evocation of Confucius. After his retirement from government, Bertin hoped to use the knowledge he had acquired to construct an authentic Chinese building and gardens at his residence at Chateau, just west of Paris. Here, he would have another cabinet chinois, a study or library, where he sought to fashion himself as a kind of archetypal Chinese scholar. Father Amiot wrote that he envisioned Bertin there as a Confucian sage, reading one of the Chinese classics or the life of Confucius. Bertin's letter accompanied a number of objects, including a signboard, bien a pair of couplets, duize, and three different examples of the character fu, meaning good fortune. Amio sent a detailed drawing with extensive notes showing the character Fu at the top, the signboard underneath, the couplet on either side, and a Chinese table set with objects for burning incense, the drawing we see here. It clearly echoes the image of a Chinese interior we saw previously in the Essay sur l'architecture chinoise. The inscription on the sideboard reads, Junza Buchi, a sage is not an instrument, a citation from the Analects of Confucius. It means that a true scholar is not a simple tool, but rather someone ready for all things. Amio's letter and the notes on the drawing contain much additional detail on how to enjoy the studio and gardens as a true Chinese scholar, a garden Amio could only visit in his imagination. For the Chateau at Chateau, Bertin sought to use his knowledge of China, the materials in his collections, both paintings and texts, and the collaboration of his Jesuit correspondence in Beijing and the creation of what he envisioned as an authentic Chinese construction in the Chinese garden setting. Bertin wrote to the Jesuit missionaries, and I quote, we have in addition many drawings of Chinese pavilions of all kind, but if some, some architect in Peking provided us another of these, we could of course prefer to execute that. Surely he meant such things as the paintings in the Essay sur l'architecture chinoise, of which we are looking at one here. It shows a pavilion at the top of an elaborate structure of garden rocks, in this case somewhat fanciful, but not too far from actual constructions, especially in imperial gardens. The architect of the chateau was Jacques Germain Soufflot, one of the most important and influential architects of the day. After Soufflot's untimely death in 1780, the project was most likely taken over by his assistant, Jean-Jacques Lecoeur. Soufflot was supposedly responsible for the design of the main building of the chateau, as well as a garden feature called the Nymphe, 
an emphaeum or grotto. The ke, a curious personality in his own right, would have been responsible for the authentic Chinese-style constructions, but his drawings that survive show only chinoiserie fantasies. In one of Bertin's letters to the Jesuit missionaries, asking for detailed information for the Chinese constructions of Chateau, he described the chateau's site along the River Seine. That description outlines what we see here in the official map of the domain of Chateau, drawn at Bertin's orders in 1780. The terraces along the Seine are clearly visible, and Soufflot's Nymphaeum is outlined here in red. The garden Bertin described in his letter is seen here at the left, a plan densely colored in green and detailing numerous paths and garden constructions. The style closely follow those of maps or plans of so-called Anglo-Chinese gardens, gardens in a hybrid Chinese style, which originated in England and were soon imitated in French gardens. If Bertin succeeded in his plans to build a Chinese-style garden or authentic Chinese constructions, this is most likely where they would have been. One brief description from Bertin's lifetime comes from the diary of John Adams, who would serve as the second president of the United States. Adams spent a day in 1778 with Benjamin Franklin and Franklin's grandson on a visit to Bertin's chateau and gardens. His diary entry dismissively describes what he called, and I quote, a collection of misshapen rocks at the end of his garden, end quote. A Chinese-style garden, perhaps. Bertin sold the chateau in 1790 and fled from France in the wake of the French Revolution. In the few known photographs of the chateau, Soufflot's original construction is only partly visible when it was already in a dilapidated condition. A photograph reproduced on a postcard shows the nymphaeum, the grotto, from the island in the Seine opposite Bertin's estate. Part of the upper floors of the chateau, with the shutters closed, appears among the trees behind the nymphaeum, which is itself the only part of the estate still extant. Bertin's gardens, as laid out in the 1780 map, would have been to the right of the chateau in this photograph. For the installation of Bertin's cabinet chinois, his Chinese study or library, Emio's letter and the diagram on how to arrange a Chinese studio point to the inspiration of Confucian ideals on Bertin's constructions, echoing the many texts published in the Memoir Concernant les Chinois, constructions which, we are left to assume, perhaps only existed in Bertin's as in Amiot's imagination. Thank you.